speakers in this session are both PCA affiliated, so obviously you're all predestined to be here. And let's see. Here we go on the start. Um, finishing up postdoc, if you happen to know anybody that will pay somebody to identify mollusks, I'd be interested to hear about it. Uh, there are a couple of questions that see ask often relating to evolution. Probably the more popular level question is, you know, why don't we see, say, new phyla or something like that evolving today if evolution is true? Uh, a more sophisticated question is relating to the overall pattern of origination. We generally see the higher categories appearing earlier in the fossil record and lower ones a bit later. For example, most of the phyla, at least the ones that have nice hard parts, are present by the end of the Cambrian. And so I wanted to look at, does this pattern that we see pose a significant problem for conventional evolutionary models or not? Now, there are a number of related questions. Uh, for example, why do you have apparently relatively rapid radiation in the Cambrian that I'm not dealing with? There's papers out there that kind of address those types of things. Uh, and since I'm talking about them a lot, just a quick review, if you don't remember from general biology, kingdoms, include phyla or divisions if you're talking about plants. Those include classes, then orders, families, genera, species. And yes, extra, extra, and aggravation are genuine scientific names of things. And you can add other classes as well. And typically, any one of these higher categories will include a few to a whole lot of lower categories. What's the pattern that we see? There is some tendency to kind of exaggerate a bit the amount of stuff coming in the Cambrian. This isn't just some wacko anti-evolution person making stuff up. You do see standard biology textbooks saying all the phyla appear right there in the Cambrian, and that's not really the case. But they are concentrated around that time. We do see a number of things in the pre-Cambrian. Then usually uh, there's only one thing that's got a decent skeleton to it that we don't see before the end of the Cambrian. And then if you look at instead of phyla classes, they tend to come in, number they're in the Cambrian, a few more a little later on, and so on down at different levels. You do, however, have some peaks in numbers of new things at various times later on in the fossil record. Pattern is similar, but a little more spread out generally if you look at other groups besides animals. Animals really have the biggest peak right at the Cambrian. It's probably, of course, you don't have a great fossil record on the fungi, but it tends to be a little bit more spread out than the others. And then we have a number of things that we only know is recent, usually stuff that's all soft, gooey, and doesn't fossilize well. Uh, here's just a couple of examples, and particularly for the early part here in the Paleozoic, there's some debate as to what really qualifies as a distinct class. So this one on the left is just kind of what I came up with off the top of my head for recognizing different classes. And then this is a published diagram in 1968. It's a little dated. I went ahead and showed there was stuff in the Cambrian, but other than that, I haven't adjusted it. And we see that at the superfamily level, it's relatively low in the broad scheme of biological categories. We don't reach the peak until relatively late up in the Cretaceous, and we've got dinosaurs running around and whatnot for bivalve superfamilies. But the class level, a much more inclusive category, like snails are one class of mollusks, we see there's at least one mollusk looking thing we've got good evidence for back in the pre Cambrian, and then quite a diversity that appear before the end of the Cambrian. There's some turnover here, these aren't exactly the same groups, but about the same number. A few more things we're starting to see, but then these squares that aren't as shaded in are groups that disappear from the fossil record. Um, one of them is soft-bodied, the other and the modern ones are entirely deep sea. And then that white square at the top is a soft-bodied form that we don't know from the fossil record. So overall, the classes seem to be reaching their peak a lot earlier than the superfamilies in this example. Now, part of this pattern is what we expect just on how we give names to things. <clears throat> this is a hierarchical system, and so, for example, 
if you found a mammal or a bird or a fish or a reptile, amphibian, any of those means you've got vertebrates. And so any higher category, its first appearance will be the oldest time for any of the included categories. <clears throat> As a perhaps more familiar example, on last names, those are inherited in family, and so last name of Campbell's been around since uh, mid-medieval is kind of the earliest documentation of them, um, much to the regret of a number of neighboring families in Scotland. <clears throat> and then, in turn, other Scots have been around. They were causing trouble for the Romans long before we heard of Campbell's. There is one particular exception, things that are classified in certain setis, uncertain category. Sometimes you've got a nice distinctive fossil, you'd like to talk about the thing, but you don't really know what it is. Uh, particularly the case with some early fossils, not sure is this the whole thing, is this just a little piece of it or what? And this is just one example, um, kind of memorable on the name. They did think of something that they thought it looked like and called it gluteus minimus, but just what sort of animal or even if it was an animal as opposed to protists or something else these came from, they couldn't figure out. Also, when you're naming a higher category, you generally pick features that you think apply at a broad level. So they tend to have relatively generic characteristics labeling it. And we may be able to recognize a higher category even if we're not too sure about the lower one. So this is a bunch of snails I've been working on lately. I've got bunch of DNA data on them, but I still don't know just what species these two are. We've got a couple of different complications involved. This one, given that's from the right area and the right shape, I'm pretty sure is an endangered one, but what to make of the other two still up in the air. Uh, also, typically, there's a good deal of nomenclatural conservatism. If you have something that looks really weird, but it turns out that you can connect it to an existing category. Usually folks just say, okay, it's a really weird one of those, rather than making up a totally new category. So anybody know, of course this is partly my drawing abilities, but any guess as to what this parasite here might be? We've got our kind of root-like part that sticks into the host and then external bit as well up there. It turns out that this thing is a barnacle. Uh, fell over there, worked a lot on barnacles, and got distracted.